You know, that song is one of my earliest memories. It's not my earliest. The earliest memories I have are of my family, my mother, things around the house. But that's one of my earliest memories of moving out from my home into the into the wide, wide world as a very, very, very little boy. Another one is saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag each morning in school, every morning. Anyone who had ever participated in that exercise could never possibly forget it because it was the only thing, aside from some prayers in some classrooms, that was absolutely mandatory throughout our life, every classroom that we ever entered into, in the morning, the first class of the day, we had to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. It is absolutely impossible that any of us could ever forget it because it happened every single school day, every morning of every school morning of our entire school life until we left school and went into either the workplace or university or college. And so these things are ingrained within us. We could no more dispense of these things than we could dispense of a finger or a toe or an ear. They are part of us. They are ingrained. It's something that we learned through repetition throughout our life. When I was a very, very little boy, I remember learning really quickly that my life was somehow different from the lives of my playmate companions in certain circumstances. For instance, when I went to kindergarten in Long Beach, California, my father was a member of the United States Army Air Force. All the other children were children of people who worked in banks and uh, people who worked in newspapers and people who drove buses and things like that. I didn't understand then how much different my life would be. But I knew that my life was different because they all had an understanding of what each of their fathers did, but they had no conception in this world about what my father did when I told them his position in our society as much as I knew to tell them, which at that time wasn't very much. Then my father was transferred to some big Air Force or Army base. At that time, it was not the Air Force. Some big Army base up in uh, Illinois. Or maybe it was the Air Force. I don't know. But he was transferred to some big Army base up in Illinois. And we rented a house in a little town called O'Fallon. Some of you who live in Illinois they know where O'Fallon is. It was a beautiful home with a huge cherry tree in the backyard. I remember it. And the entire countryside was lush with trees and vegetation. In the summertime, the fireflies took over the countryside. It was heaven for children. There were ponds, and, and they had that pond smell that you don't smell anymore today. And there were fish in those ponds, and turtles, and snakes, and uh, big, giant night crawlers. If you dug next to the pond, you could come up with these huge worms with which to fish with. And uh, there were snapping turtles, which were terrifying because of the tales that were told about how they chopped off the finger of the last suspecting child who stuck his hand 
beneath the surface of the pond. <laughs> I remember all those tales. It was also my first my first, and this is fitting for this broadcast, as you will come to discover, it was my first encounter with a bully. And I mean a real bully. I don't remember the name of the school that I attended in O'Fallon, Illinois, but I remember to this day the face of my first grade teacher. She was a wonderful woman, kind uh, I don't remember her ever becoming angry with me or any other person in our class. She taught us. She helped us. She corrected us. Uh, we learned from her. And we learned an awful lot. When I first began attending that school, I would go in in the morning and my mother would always give me this little brown paper bag to carry that contained my lunch. And... Uh, on the first day of school, I remember being confronted by three boys, all three of whom were bigger than me, and uh, they wanted my lunch and I refused to give it to them. Two of them grabbed me by the arms and held me, while the third, whom I later named, was nicknamed Squirrel. I don't know why his nickname was Squirrel. I never learned what his real name was nor do I know the names of his two confederates. But Squirrel began to pummel me with his fists, particularly about the stomach and the solar plexus area, and uh, soon I was rendered incapable of resistance. And he took my lunch. And this became the norm every morning, until one morning I went to school. I managed to get there early, I gave my lunch to a friend to hold. I was determined that this was never going to happen to me again. I waited until Squirrel and his two buddies came, and they were waiting for me to present myself at the school gate. I walked up behind Squirrel, and I hit him on the shoulder real hard. He swirled around and I lit into him with both fists as hard as I could, and I pummeled his face until he was bleeding from the mouth and from the nose. And from that date onward, I was never bothered again by Squirrel and his two buddies, nor did I see them preying upon anyone else. And I learned a lesson that day that... Uh, you cannot allow yourself to be bullied, ever. You cannot allow yourself to come under the specter of tyranny. You cannot ever allow yourself to be the object of despotism. Now, I didn't understand all of that at that age. I just knew that if I could win with him one time, he wouldn't bother me again. I knew that instinctively. And that became a pattern throughout my life because my father was a military officer. He was an Air Force officer. And uh, we, we were only at, uh, and I think it was Chanute. That name comes Chanute Air Force Base or Army Air Force Base in Illinois. But we were only there for my first grade year. And then we moved back to California. And my father was sent to the Philippines, and we were not allowed to go with him. And for the next year, I spent my second grade in an elementary school in Long Beach, California. What I had learned in Illinois served me well. And I had no problems with any of the students in the school whatsoever at all, because any any time, any, any instant, when anybody began to pick on me or make fun of me or try to, by coercion, elicit something from me, I very quickly confronted them and smacked them as hard as I could in the nose, and they never, ever did it again. And I made a lot of friends. And I had a wonderful time there. Then my father returned from the Philippines, 
and we were once again transferred. And so he had to go ahead as always. That's always the way it happened. And then we followed. At that time, I understood that we lived in a free country, but I didn't really know what that meant. I was just a little boy. But I understood, I understood very clearly that weakness meant enslavement. I already knew that at that very young age. So my father was transferred to the Azor Islands off the coast of Portugal in the Atlantic Ocean. Some people say that they are the remnants, the last remnants of the continent of Atlantis. I say bullshit. They're the peaks of, of uh, very tall uh, uh, volcanoes that have erupted from the seafloor. It's very clear. But nevertheless, my mother, uh, myself, my brother, and my sister uh, got our passport pictures taken together. My mother had one passport for all of us. All of us were in one picture. And we took the Santa Fe Super Chief from Los Angeles to Chicago. What a great experience that was. And I have to tell you, that was, uh, that was uh, sometime in the, in the 40s. It was an incredible journey. It lasted uh, about three days. And uh, I don't remember whether it was two or three nights. We were on the train. We had our sleeping compartment. We ate in the dining car. We got to go sit in the observation car. And we met a lot of people who were traveling. And it wasn't like today at all. Everyone dressed. Everyone wanted to present their very best appearance for everybody, even if they didn't have the means to purchase suits and, uh, and the kind of, of dresses that that uh, they might see in the magazines, they wore whatever they had that was the very best that they had. And so did we. My mother would not let us leave our compartment without being dressed to the T. And it was that way throughout my life. And it was an experience. It made everything special. Not like today, where you get on the train and you might be sitting next to someone who's wearing a suit and tie, and across the aisle is someone wearing a pair of shower clogs, a t-shirt, and short shorts. It's not special at all. It's taken down to the lowest common denominator, and it's degraded, debased. Everything is. But that's not the subject of tonight's broadcast. When we reached Chicago, we caught another train, which took us to some place uh, on the East Coast, and I think it was New York City. I think it was New York City. And we disembarked, met my father. We got on another train that took us to Massachusetts, and then we went to Westover Field, and from there we flew on a military propeller-driven aircraft across the Atlantic Ocean to Lodges Field in the Azores. These are the memories of my young boyish life. In that airplane, there were no seats like you find on modern airliners today. They were what were called bucket seats. They were like nets. And there were rows of nets going up along the side of the aircraft. You could either sit in the net or you could lay down and go to sleep. 